uh, IRI. And we have two more experts from IRI, leading experts Gleb Gusev and Bulat Ibrahimov. Over to them. Good evening. We represent the Institute for AI and a group for theory and algorithms. When I ask the students, young men and older generation alike today, what is AI for them today? What sort of applications of AI can you name? What successful stories of AI application can you name? More often than not, they name working with, they name working with images, like super resolution of an image. Or something that even goes more with the fashion, but normally that's really limited when you apply it in practice. For example, self-driving cars that are not yet ready for market, by all means. They name systems that with reinforcement learning can win in a game of Go or chess against human. And they, by all means, call deep learning and neural networks that are behind all of those apps. And then I say that in the future, we shall see a lot of apps. But right now, in terms of global economics, what are the apps that are making major contribution based on AI? What are the apps that make a major contribution into the development of this approach? Search systems, systems of recommendations, social networks, and other internet applications that we use every day are based on the same principles and algorithms for statistical machine learning. And in these traditional areas, they use gradient boosting. Gradient boosting is useful when you have a ton of different features that have different nature, when many features are made manually by a coder, or those features are delivered from other models like neural networks. Gradient boosting can aggregate very well, it's quite flexible, and unfortunately, there are not so many publications lately that show how to improve gradient boosting, the quality of it, because it's a quite a legacy algorithm, and there are not many things that you can vent to it. We wanted to tell you about the work that makes contribution into gradient boosting and denies the point of view that there is nothing that you can do pretty much with gradient boosting. Let me hand over the mic to the major author of this work, Bulat Ibrahimov. Bulat, go. I have this one, thank you. <laughs> Gleb, thank you. Indeed, quite often in the apps, we can see neural networks, uh, to images, video, etc. However, we forget that the world is not only multimedia, also different sort of tables, uh, heterogeneous data that have figures in them, categories in them, text in them, and gradient boosting is able to cope with those tasks the best. So we decided to try to find out the optimal number of trees and see what's the optimal number of trees that is necessary for gradient boosting to get the model the best quality. And as uh, our presentation says, we are still suggesting to learn together. So my story will consist of a number of parts. First of all, I will briefly remind you what are the parts of gradient boosting. Then I will discuss the problem, set the problem that we'll be discussing. And then I will talk about the approach to tackle this problem. And then we'll be talking about validation protocol to evaluate the quality of our approach. And I will demonstrate a couple of experiments showing that our approach indeed works and can directly improve the quality of today's model for today's tasks. So, gradient boosting is the ensemble method to build algorithms that is based on this. We have a set of weak algorithms, and with them we want to build an ensemble, a model that will be giving decent quality and solve our business tasks, etc. For that, we're training the first simple model, and we see what error that models gives us for our object. To be more precise, we count gradients of errors for every object. Every next model is trained based on those gradients so that our goal to decrease the number of errors or to put it scientifically, we're doing a gradient step in a functional space. So we add the model to our ensemble. After a number of steps, we get a potent model that solves the task with minimal error. So the key problem in building ensemble and gradient boosting is how do you 
select the optimal number of trees, meaning steps. The classical situation for machine learning in general, if we use a model that's too simple with low number of trees, we get the under-trained model that cannot identify all of the patterns in the data. If we use too many trees and too flexible model, this is the over-trained model that can catch the complex patterns in data, but it retrains based on accidental noises, it's unstable in terms of delivery, so we want to find a perfect point for a good model between under-trained and over-trained model. So classical approach is that with the use of some sort of uh, cross uh, cons consultative pool, we evaluate the quality of our model for every given point of time, so for every given number of trees, and we build a graph based on averaging, and we build certain pipelines or standard deviation, so standard error deviation. So when we get this learning curve, we can select a perfect point and see in which point we get the minimum, in which point the error stops going down, and we see that this amount of trees there is perfect. So this is the approach which, in our opinion, is a key error made by modern researchers. Machine learners who are using gradient boosting for their tasks, meaning this cross-validation protocol does not take into account the fact that data is heterogeneous. Let's think about it. When we apply our gradient boosting to real-life tasks, the data consists of a mix of different distributions. For example, they may be heterogeneous. They may contain different domains and fields where we see completely diverse properties. At this slide, for example, you may see a very simple algorithm. What did we do? We took a data set, we split it by a clustering algorithm into separate regions, and we trained the model based on the entire data set. And then to every region, we applied our model and built learning curves. And we see quite a curious image here. There is about a half of clusters for which our model turned out to be under-trained. With the red points, we see best iterations for every cluster separately. In the meantime, there's quite a lot of clusters where our model turns out to be under-trained. These are the points that are shown on the right. So if we increase the number of trees, the error will go down in the clusters and on the clusters on the left for the red points. The model is well trained. So if we take a look at the overall good point of our gradient boosting, it turns out to be somewhere in the middle. So we get some sort of paradox. On the one hand, we have a ton of points which are overtrained and a ton of points that are undertrained, but medium is good. So probably we would like to get something better for every group separately. We would like to calculate separate perfect point and restore optimal installations. So there is this naive approach that suggests let's just take for every object and calculate the optimal point of stop and build some regression model or classification model that will predict this point. Unfortunately, this is too naive. It does not work. Why? Because let's take a simple look at um, uh, the graph of dependencies uh, of error for every single object separately, depending on the number of iterations. You will see quite a noisy image. I mean, the gradients, I mean errors per every object, are changing quite significantly. The oscillation is a bit too much. It looks like an accidental Gaussian noise. And there's some, actually, this, this actually purple graph is a random Gaussian process with pretty much the same compared to the history of learning and training for every single object. So if our task is predicting optimal point, that evaluation probably will be overinflated because uh, the accidental process will be getting a minimum at the point to the right from the actual optimal minimum. So what do we suggest? Our main idea is let us take with a certain clustering algorithm and break apart our selected spaces into the sea of regions and in every region separately. We'll compute the perfect points of stop. The approach is simple and evident. Unfortunately, however, it's not well described. So we are filling the gap. So we have broken apart the space into C spaces in every region based on cross-validation selection, based on evolution faults, we continue to the optimum point, and we apply this model to our test pool, test data set. So we're looking at test point, we refer to a particular cluster, and depending on which cluster it falls to, we assign a particular optimal number of iterations. And we truly hope that the uh, evaluation that we get is better than universal ensemble size.
In this protocol, like in any other method that's only suggested in white papers, there's a problem. How do you validate that? Whether it truly works, that's the main <laughs> elephant in the room. It's not quite evident how would you qualify the clusterization, whether it works or not. Oh, we should just preserve universal method of stops, which is quite classical and has been working for decades. In addition, our algorithm delivers additional hyperparameters into training. For example, how do you cluster objects? Really, what clustering algorithm you'd be applying? Second question, what's the number of clusters that you select? Third question, what are the properties of these clusters? Meaning, what's the size of these clusters? The perfect size. And the problem is that directly via cross-validation selection, it's impossible to answer all those questions. Why? Because via cross-validation selection, you are selecting optimal point of stop. If we do the same cross-validation selection to validate for scoring our approach, uh, the, we see that the more clusters we have, the, the better is the quality. However, in the real life, in the test, we'll see a radically different image. Also, it's probably evident that if we increase the number of clusters, then indeed we will catch some local particularities. But in the meantime, the score will be more noisy because we will be making a conclusion based on lower number of subjects. So I suggest a different evolution protocol that's also described in our white paper. So it consists of uh, this cross-validation, S1, S2, SK, etc., and every fold is split into a number of clusters in a unified way. Please take a note that breaking it into folds or clusters are completely independent. The, fl the folds are made based on uh, random subsampling and breaking apart into region is based on clusterization algorithms. So what do we do next? We put out from consideration a fold queue. We put it out of consideration and we aggregate learning curves for every cluster taking into account all of the faults apart from the queue that we have fall, we have dropped out. Based on this result, aggregated result, we evaluate optimal point of stop and apply it to the previously uh, dropped uh, queue fault. So we have evaluated the optimal stop point on all the faults except for one, and we can use the dropped fault to evaluate the quality. This algorithm does not fully eliminate the deviation. Of course, the fault queue has been used to train based on S1, S2, etc. faults, but uh, you will see in the experimental section that this algorithm is pretty much awesome, helping us to decorrelate the results of our cross-validation selection. And here are our experiments. What have we done? We've taken simple, classical, very popular implementation of gradient boosting. Uh, cat boost, cat boost. You know that it allows you to get uh, results for most data sets. It has been used for most tasks, and we have corrected with one little point the setting of the optimal number of trees for gradient boosting. What do we see at every graph? This graph shows our validation protocol compared to naive validation and the, qual the test quality. So obviously we see that naive validation, if we use cross-validation pool for the optimal number of trees and we use the same cross-validation pool for uh, validation of our results for the setting of the optimal number of clusters, optimal number of clusters, their size, optimal algorithms for clustering, uh, the um, Evaluation is going down monotonously. If we use, however, our cross-validation that gets us rid of the deviation towards the validation data set, you see that it sort of replicates the contours and all the dependencies that we see in the test. So thanks to this sort of graph, we can be sure to correctly estimate whether our method works well. And if the method doesn't work, if we see some sort of monotonous increase of the error depending on the number of clusters or the size of clusters, we can easily get rid of this method and use classical universal st stop. If we see improvement, we can easily believe that there is strong correlation with what we see on the test and use it for the search of optimal number of parameters. And below there we see the results for some standard benchmarks, uh, algorithms for gradient boosting, and we see that for most of them we can see quite significant improvement of the model only thanks to individual or adaptive um, setting of the hyperparameters of the stop point. 
another thing that I should mention. How expensive is this sort of game? Do we really need so meticulously select the size of clusters, the amount of clusters, and how long does it work? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, turns out that all of this procedure takes quite little time compared to training of the entire model. A validation protocol works pretty quickly. And therefore, overall, tuning doesn't cost you much. So pretty much for free, you can get decent quality. You can get new method for adaptive stop point. And this method could be easily implemented to current implementation of gradient boosting, if you have those. And also in the open source project and gradient boosting that's used in businesses individually, etc., and for particular tasks as well. Therefore, I would conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope there are questions. You guys, dear friends, let me remind you that you can answer your questions to our distinguished speaker using a special sort of QR code that you can see on your screens. Please do not hesitate to scan the QR codes using your smartphone and ask questions to our distinguished guests. For some reason, my questions don't refresh, you guys. Can you whisper me a question and I will definitely transfer them to, to the speakers if there are questions. How do you plan further on? What are your further plans? What are you going to do? Let me say this. Indeed, um, if we return, let's return to the slides. Slide with motivation. You can see here that there is a number of objects. If we approach the point of optimal stop, if we remove it, at this point they are quite well trained. So if we further train on, they only increase noise in the process of learning. That's why it would have been great for this point if we, at the moment of training, understand that for a certain point they are well trained and there is nothing new that our model can deliver. I believe for that point we can cut the learning process and only train based on those examples that were under trained. So therefore we reduce the noise of these objects and also we can accelerate the process of learning, I meaning prune our ensemble, particularly at the time of learning. In addition, uh, there are a number of, of ideas how you can build clustering separately. I have not said about that. I probably should. Our method allows simply to inclusively use the clustering method. If we use the first tree in the ensemble for gradient boosting, then the first tree is uh, pretty much a good way to break apart our space because it takes into account its geometry, target, and if you use the first tree for the clustering algorithm, we do not spend the time for additional clusterization and we also get pretty decent um, uh, split to actually set adaptive uh, tuning for every cluster. Thank you, guys. These were all of the questions. Let's continue.